The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Are you tired of cutting things manually? In this episode of The Ben Heck Show, we're going to build an automatic CNC router and design the Xbox 360 laptop. Stay tuned. In the year 2000, Ben Heckendorn built his first mod. We can rebuild it smaller, better, portable. Since then, he has continued his work, helping those in need with creative new projects. Got an idea you'd like to see built? Why not send it to the Ben Hack Show? Hello and welcome back. It's going to be a busy episode, so let's jump right into the viewer challenge. It comes from Rick Dunn, who writes Hi, Ben. I'd like to see your take on a small tabletop and possibly semi portable CNC machine. It would be great for your projects, and I think it would be something your fans would duplicate and use a lot. It would be cool to use one with steppers that are easy to get for relatively cheap and a Dremel for the cutting head, or something more awesome if you have a better idea for a cutter. Thanks for considering. Sounds fun! Let's start by looking at the basic parts of a CNC machine and how they work together. Let's look at what a CNC machine is. CNC stands for Computer Numerical Control, so basically it's any machine controlled by a computer. An inkjet printer is a good example of this. The computer drives a stepper motor, which makes the head move back and forth so it can precisely put the dots for the image where they need to go. However, the kind of machine we're going to be building today is a CNC router. This is a machine that moves a router head around, which can cut out shapes from material below it. Before we start the build, let's look at the parts that make up one of these machines and the system around it. Part design. You draw up what you want to make in an editing program and save it in a file format that can be read by the G-Code Generator. This is a program that takes your artwork and turns it into G-Code that the CNC machine can understand, usually things called tool paths. G-Code is usually a text file that is then streamed from the computer to the G-Code Interpreter. Sometimes this is done by the PC as well and sent over the parallel port, but in our case we're using an Arduino-based motherboard to interpret the code into step and direction pulses that will be sent to the stepper drivers! This board has three of them for X, Y, and Z. A step pulse tells the motor to move one increment, and direction can be high or low, telling it which way to move. The motors are installed in the CNC table itself. I've drawn up plans for one, and this is where our build will begin. We were out more portable CNC machines before breakfast than most people do in their entire lives. Using this very advanced networking system of thumb drives, the data is put onto the router computer, which is just another computer. And every little shape is given a different tool path. Now as you can see, some of them, some of them have different patterns. See these magenta lines? That's a clean out. That's where the bit goes in and goes like cleans out a section, kind of like carving a canoe in ancient uh, American times. Now, with all the holes drilled in the middle, it's time to do the perimeters of the objects. We select all the objects, and then we do a male cut, which means on the outside. With all the parts cut, it was time to move on to the barn. It's a great location to put things together, make a mess, and it has a mini fridge. However, it's a hot summer day out and our only source of cooling is a single fan built during the Eisenhower administration. I've started to assemble the Z drive. So here's the stepper motor. This screw here drives the motor up and down and then it slides on these rails. See how that's going to work? And the center material is fairly soft, so the screw will basically countersink itself. All right, well, we're ready to see if we get the Z assembly working correctly or if it's going to explode into flames and kill us all. All right, so as you can see, I've got these 
analog joysticks from an Xbox. So let's see what happens. Hooked up to the propeller, going to the driver board, going to the separate motor. Right. Okay, so as you can see, we have the X-axis stepper motor here and it's in the assembly from the designs we saw. And so basically what happens is it fits into this arm here. So let's, uh, oh crap. Um, some people call this a Dremel. I prefer the term misengineering compensation tool. All right, so uh, you may remember the X-axis assembly from earlier and the uh, re-engineering I had to do. So we're going to take our z-axis and slide it into place, and this is basically how it works. Yeah. And then this slides back and forth based off this motor, and then there's an end cap here. Alright, well I've got the caps on the end of the x-axis, so now we can test it. As you can see, I've partially assembled the y-axis, which drives it. I'm missing the tool steel for these two rails, so I'm gonna use some wooden dowels I have laying around. When you're working on something like this with pre-drilled holes, you want a little bit of the, of the screw coming through. That way, when you line it up to the piece, it'll lock in place. So the arm itself just goes back and forth. As far as the up and down Y movement, the table itself moves off this frame. So we have this tubing here, which I got from McMaster Car, a great website. There we go. And this is much like how the Z-axis worked. quarter cable motor I got. I got this at Farmer Fleet for about a hundred bucks. And this is gonna go on here. So basically it's kind of easier to move the motor. Okay, so we've mounted the motor uh, to the frame. So now we're gonna use these hose clamps. Probably don't actually need them, but whatever. It'll help with vibration. Okay, here goes nothing. Well, I think it'll be a lot better once we get it uh, fully computerized, but uh, the three axis, they work, so that's, uh, that's good. It's time once again to take a break from our viewer challenge and work on the big build. In this episode, we'll be designing the case for the Xbox 360 laptop. Okay, well, we're going to start with the Xbox 360 motherboard. And uh, what I've done is I've actually put it into the scanner. It's not an absolute kind of measurement, but it's actually fairly close. So what you do is you scan it into Photoshop or a similar program, and then you erase or make little white holes around all the screw holes. And then you can overlay this with vector graphics, and we're using Adobe Illustrator as usual. And what we can do is go in and make some circles to represent the screw holes. The screw holes are important because you know we're going to want to match those to what's on the uh, computer. So even though we've made a shape for the screw hole based off the scan, we want to double check it. So take the good old dial caliper, get the diameter of it, and then we punch that into the computer. Another good thing you can do is you can take the outside shape here of the square of the circuit board and you make one measurement. You measure how far in the edge of the circle is. Do this, offset pass, negative 0.086, and now you have the consistent edge of all, the, of all the circles. As you can see, it's not exactly matching what the scan was, but we measured it off the board so we, don't, we know that it's accurate. I took a photograph of the motherboard top down and used it to um, rough out the placement of all the major items such as the um, jacks in the back and the heat sink. What I've done here, for instance, with all these ports up here, is you start with a measurement, like let's, if, let's say if you're gonna draw in the um, power port, you take your super handy dial caliper and you go whoop, find that distance, you make a square that matches the distance, and then you move the drawing of your power port to match the edge of it. And, one thing I like about Illustrator is you can snap to objects pretty easily, so I can take this and it goes boink, and sticks right to it. So we want to know the elevation of all the components. And as you can see, the major things to think about are going to be the heatsink, of course, the ports in the back, and the average height of all the capacitors. 
Now what we can do for the average height is get a measurement. And then on the screen, we draw a shape that represents all the average capacitor heights, which is this shape right here. See it? You can also see the USB ports right there. So that's good. So as you can see, we've drawn in shapes to represent uh, pretty much all the major components. Now the fan adds a lot of unnecessary height to it. You gotta allow them to empty space right here. We can actually fill this empty space with circuitry that we'd otherwise have to put elsewhere. All right, next we've got the ring of light. Draw a rectangle like that. And its length is telling you if uh, you have any interest at all in designing things, get a dial caliper, they're great. Someone might say, if you had a digital one, you could just push a button to switch it from metric to English. And I'm like, or I could just get a metric dial caliper. Yeah, and then, you know, and then I have like dial calipers laying around everywhere and yeah. But I'm not obsessive compulsive, no, no, no. Now, the important thing on the Ring of Light is the LED right there, the light LED. We get an exact position of that, you know, by measuring in from the sides and we draw it on the screen. And that's kind of our key holder, so to speak. So when we place our drawing of the ring itself, we just center it right on that and then it's in the correct position. DVD drive is a little bigger. You can get one of the measurements this way, as you can see. And the length of the DVD drive kind of exceeds the dial caliper, so I'm just gonna use a ruler. And we put it to seven here, and that way on this end, near the one inch, we have smaller marks, we can get a more accurate measurement. Six and three quarters plus a 32nd of an inch. So what's kind of cool, what you can do in Illustrator is go six and three quarters plus one 32nd of an inch. And then you get the number. See that? Pretty cool, huh? And of course, if you want to convert fractions to decimals, you just do three divided by four. Three quarters of an inch is 0.75, pretty simple. Oh, what's 5 16 5 divided by 16. Oh, it's 0 0.3125. Okay, once we have all the parts drawn into the computer, it's time to arrange them. So as you can see on the screen here, we have the motherboard, the power supply, and the DVD drive. These are the main components that take up most of the space. So we have this shape here, which represents the case. Basically pick the smallest size we can get away with. In this case, it's 16 inches wide by 10.75 inches high. And that's actually dictated by the screen, the LCD, which you see here. This represents the LCD, and as you can see, we've made the case pretty much absolutely as small as it can be and still fit the LCD. The LCD is by far the largest part, so it dictates the size of the case. All right, well, the next thing to do once we have all the components basically laid out is to detail it, make it look fancy. So um, what I've got right here is the top layer plastic, and this is still in wireframe, but if I render it, we see this. Now, the basic idea behind this is we keep everything symmetrical, and we have this big circular fan cover, which is pretty much exactly like what I did in the PlayStation 3 laptop. If you're going to plagiarize someone, plagiarize yourself. And elsewhere, I've got tons and tons of vent holes. See all these up here? And not only do they allow air in, but they look cool. So here's the main elevation. As you can see, we have the DVD drive here and behind it is the power supply. And the power supply is up off the bottom of the case because we're going to put the SATA cable for the DVD here in this spot. So the real tricky part when you start to do these things is to take the case apart on the screen to make parts you can route. Now, while this drawing here might appear um, very complex, when you break it down into pieces to um, export for routing, for lack of a better term, it actually becomes a lot more simplified. And uh, we pick apart all the walls from the main plan drawing and we put them over here. We've grouped all the walls into about, uh, about a square foot of material. So yeah, nesting it and breaking it apart makes it a lot easier and cheaper to route because you're using less material. And then finally, we have these small pieces here, basically little incidentals. These will be done on a laser cutter. Speaker and hard drive mounts right here. We've got some little air hole plates. One of them you remove to get the hard drive. The other one's just more air holes. You can never have enough air holes. Just ask the original Xbox 360 if you can ever have enough air holes. It would say never and then die. All right, we've got the design done. In the next episode, we'll show you how we use this data to route the parts with a CNC machine. Wow, that was some of the most riveting computer screen action I have ever seen. Now let's go back and finish the CNC machine. We're here in a suburb of Milwaukee, where Chris Kraft is looking at some Arduino-based compatible microprocessor boards. In the wilds of Milwaukee, it's really important to be safe. 
Last year, over 3 million people went to Summerfest and they all got drunk. Okay, Chris, well, why don't you tell us how this Arduino style uh, board is going to power a CNC machine? Basically, I've got some software that I've uh, constructed using the Arduino software. We load it up onto the Arduino and uh, we should be able to just plug this into your CNC controller, feed the G-code to it over the serial port on the computer. If it works right, we'll see the CNC machine start moving. It's micro-stepping how many steps per rotation then? I know it's set to um, 1 8 micro-step and it takes 1600 pulses on the step line to do one revolution of the motor. Okay. And how many rotations does it take to go an inch? Well, the threads are 10 TPI, threads per inch, so it would take 16,000 steps to go one inch. Oh, uh, you gotta love base 10 mathematics. Just slap a zero on the end and all your work's done for you. Okay, we think we're gonna have better luck by using this AT Mega 644. Uh, and what we've done is we've used solder paste to place all these surface mount components on this board and now we're going to bake it, right Chris? That's the plan. So Chris, this is the reflow oven? It looks like a toaster oven. Yes, it, it was a Black & Decker uh, infrawave, infrared toaster oven. So I just uh, converted the controls so that through USB the computer can then turn the oven and off. Doing reflowing, you need to you need to maintain precise temperatures for precise time. This is the all new 2010 Infrawave oven by Black and Decker. Look at this puppy! It can reflow solder. It can make tostadas. It can cook a pizza for an entire family. Now how much would you pay for this fine device? It's available now in stores near you and it's Mac compatible. Okay, we're gonna start with some really simple G code in the Replicator G program that will spool to the motherboard which will then send it to the CNC machine. Okay, here's the G code. It's G21, which means metric. G90, which means absolute positioning. G1 F360, which means the feed rate, 360 millimeters per minute. Then here's the movement commands. Go to X40, then go to Y20, X negative 40, Y negative 20, and this will make a square. Yeah, let's see if this works. Uh, Chris, want to start up the router itself? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <coughs> oh, that particulate set off the fire alarm. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty good. You made yeah, it cut. it cut the square, and even with this big wide V bit, the torque was sufficient to um, cut consistently. You know, it didn't bind up and right. stop. Yeah, so there we did it. We got a homemade CNC machine to run G code and cut wood, and it only shot off one smoke detector. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Join us next time as we attempt to build an automatic can crusher. <laughs> like that, but automatic, and also start cutting the Xbox 360 laptop case. See you then. The Ben Heck Show is made possible by our sponsors at Element 14. For more information on all my projects and for a list of all the parts I use today, visit element14.com. Visit their community in the Ben Heck Show group using the URL below. Join me there to get more details about a chance to win the Xbox 360 laptop we're building. We'll see you next time.